Horatio Delbert. So uh, this is the kind of the concentrates guy. Uh, you might think he's a concentrates guy. Uh, you might think he's the concentrates guy. This conversation will help clarify what you think moving forward. So I will let uh, the conversation speak for itself. Very unique individual, Horatio Delbert. All right, Horatio Delbert. Horatio, thanks for being with us. No problem. So tell me, you're you're sort of the guy here. You're the concentrates guy. How does someone get to be a concentrate specialist in, in cannabis, you know? Hmm. Uh, how did you get to where you are now? Uh, they found, however I've chosen to devote my life to cannabis, extremely inspiring, I suppose. And over the course, I guess, of my short career, I've managed to, on multiple occasions, produce new upon new upon new, upon new when it comes to products and innovations that um, I guess it's that's how you become the guy. It's not one thing. It's the fact I don't, I guess I don't quit. Right. So when did you first start taking uh, some form of interest in, in cannabis? Was it was it something that started when you were younger or did it happen kind of later in life? Um, like, I guess, I don't know if it's most people who turn into the experts. Around age 14, I found that little Kodak um, film container of my father's where all the roaches were. And he had such big hands as a working man that his roaches were my joints for the week. So, and he never went back to them. So, like, between the ages of 14 and maybe 18, I had a full career with um, Jamaican imported um, high grade ganja that um, really shaped my creative mind through my younger years. Um, I was very, very driven and ended up in my um, first career of 20 years by the time I was 15. Wow. So, well, then let me ask you, you mentioned that cannabis shaped your creative mind, you know, in, in what way? Uh, you know, how do you feel it shaped your uh, creativity or outlook on things? Uh, it mainly comes in suppressing those triggers inside that are your normal boundaries and limits. So even if it's something as simple as, well, I can't watch this documentary, it's outside of my culture. The tribe won't approve of me exploring. Uh, when you're alone and it's Friday night and that pizza's half in you, you might explore um, the viewpoints of Shaolin monks or everyone um, ends up exploring something that their creative mind normally wouldn't consider. And with that, taking in that new information, taking in those opposite points of view, I've always been able to step out of my tribe and my culture. And so that led me to, in my case, a love of video games, which translated into a love of graphics and art. So um, my creative background is very, very colorful in their visuals. Um, I ended up, yeah, I ended up in pretty much I, the first time I ended up trying to quit my main career, it was to do visual spiritual inspiration. So it was a lot of, um, you know, statues and stuff, but brought to life as if you could almost say as if you were tripping and experiencing them on the plane that they exist. So um, that was a very deep relationship with me, cannabis and um, a lot, a lot of photography and um, art, basically being able to see things on a different plane. All right, so Horatio, let's let's take a detour for a moment because uh, we have to talk about your love of uh, graphics. You know, where and how long did you uh, do that for? Um, I was a visual effects artist, so in the end, I ended up like visual effects supervisor. So over, I don't know, I've been, I've lived in London, I've lived all over the world for computer graphics. So um, like during the big Harry Potter boom, I worked in London. Uh, during Back when the first big comic movies, like uh, the first Batman and like Hellboy, I worked in San Francisco. It took me around the world. And I, it's funny, um, we started with that story of my father's cannabis. When I lived in London, I called home and I'm, Dad, I can't, everything to smoke is, it's weird. It's weird. He said, go see your uncle. Um, I went to Brixton. I saw my uncle and he was owned a restaurant and he took me to the back and I'm like what the fuck is daddy's free freezer doing here and he opened up the freezer and it was the same Jamaican import <laughs> I grew up on same one but in London because it takes that route when it leaves when it leaves Jamaica one boat goes to Montreal but one boat splits off and heads to England and it was literally the same shit it wasn't really till California that I started 
trying other strains that uh, really threw me for a loop. So tell me, it um, you know, it, it seems like your whole graphics career is is going great. You're you're doing all this traveling. What led you to pursue something else? Oh my God, I've been through so many changes. I mean, I remember time in movies, not years. So like, oh, I started on this in store, but um, I had always been um, a permaculture um, enthusiast so nature and organic systems and designing ecosystems was a big part of my life so solving petrochemical needs was a natural thing we did um, how can you reorganize or reshape the land so that you don't need so much energy to um, get abundance so literally um, during my course of um, I think I was working on 300 I was doing a ton of blood for some movie and I'm like I don't understand how your life has gotten back to blood dude you said you swore off blood years ago and here you are cracking a guy's head open with skulls and everyone's cheering about your ability to make um you know you could say illusions real but um I was just getting introduced to concentrates as a patient you know outside of work so I had a it was this weird conflict of my job turning back into just producing violence and I quit smoking cigarettes and then I got into this big question about how can I fill my body with butane hash oil and then go home and say we have to eat clean meat that we have to grow ourselves because chicken from a factory is no good it nothing lined up Right. It didn't seem as if it was bringing you the same sense of enjoyment that maybe you felt when you were younger. Mm. Uh, so so how do we bridge your passion for graphics of the, uh, you know, from the earlier days to to getting back uh, to, to cannabis? It seems like uh, like there are some parallels there. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you specifically. So after Harry Potter. I had, you know, you kind of, you make it to where the big names and every, you can, no matter what you work on, you can say it and everyone goes, ooh, wow. And there was just a huge lack of, I just wasn't fulfilled. And I got an opportunity to start a boutique um, for producing those talking dog movies. Um, the Air Bud series, they, he had some kids and it's a five kid dog series. Um, I ran though a production company that produced that, those films specifically and it had a huge impact on my life. I spent so much time with animals and all we did was for kids. So you end up in a more um, jovial work environment, but it was really when the films came out and I could see things like the adoption rate of dogs go up based on a DVD. Kids watched 19 times in a row, then wrangled their parents to get them a puppy. Um, those were the few times where I was really, really satisfied with my career. And you know, when I, those opportunities would end, I would always question like, well, what made, what did I love doing? And it was really building com complex systems to serve humans in a beneficial way from the employees getting a uh, work opportunity to work in an environment that was like nothing they'd ever experienced to being able to go, look, dude, um, we're going to go on set today and visit this kid with um, this video footage that we made of... Um, the dog talking to her specifically and she's going to go crazy this like we have make a wish foundation every film and so i had you know people who could participate normally you don't get an opportunity in life to make a difference so i'm like look make this dog say that um on set she's got a sore throat and she can't talk right now but she recorded this video and i started that was my first really getting in physical proximity to people who lived with human suffering and how that, you know, I'm like, I could see that little change. And then as cannabis started to become more and more prevalent and being able to do that for people, I started to question, I'm like, is this a gift to man that we're fucking up? Because in some rare cases, it seems to do the same thing the dogs could do. And it seems to be that um, open up some light of love inside of people that heals them. And I could see it with cannabis. I could, I remember like I've had many times in my life where, yeah, this cannabis is making me slow. I quit, I quit, I quit. And you become such a driven, hardened person. And then one day someone, I remember the day, like I went a year and a half without smoking and someone convinced me, I broke my hand and someone was like, take this joint for your hand. And the, my wife and my daughter came home and there was music playing and they were like, uh oh. I think daddy's gotten back into the chuff because he's giggling and he's fucking with us way too much. And um, it just, it, it was the one time where I, like, I had stopped and I realized 
I don't know if I was becoming a conservative or just those hyper driven people that can't. The goal is so important that um, the journey, um, they just destroy it. Do you think that graphics had a uh, part to do uh, with this transformation? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, how are you usually? Well, I'm usually the guy that <sighs> I had a hist. They would, wherever I would bring the joy to the situation, and that could get you fired, it could get you displaced, it could be you end up the troublemaker, but everyone will write down like it was the happiest time of my life working with you. Um, so, yeah, fighting for opportunities to create that. And, and the drive of that situation is it's prestige. So every movie is the only movie that exists, and it's the only thing that counts. And it its reward cycle is two weeks. For two weeks, everyone sees what you do, and then it's like, I got to work another eight months for your attention. And, I mean, it's its a shallow goal, and I'm you could say... I have a gift to work really hard and really, really long hours and somehow survive it, but for what ends? All right. So moving back to cannabis, uh, is this around the time uh, when, you know, that switch happened or or not yet? Um, You know, let's get into how you started uh, getting more involved with the plant and the industry. Oh, it was a different point. It it was... um... One day, someone asked me, they gave me a discount, and they were like, you have a medical card. Of course you do. That's why I give you a discount. And I said, what? And um, they're like, I sold you a concentrate rig. And I'm like, yeah, where can you get some concentrates for this thing anyway? So I went into um, the dispensary, and I tried it. And that teenage experience where it's like that one hit, and I'm just going to play this whole album, it happened again. And I was like, whoa, this... You're a medical patient and you're a recreational patient. You don't really understand why. You just kind of are drawn to certain things. So I got into that and I quit cigarette smoking and got into vaping. And there was just this constant nag from my wife that if this is supposed to be better for you, why are you dying every time you take a hit? And I couldn't answer. And there was that part of my body that had just felt the... You know, cigarettes are very accumulative, little by day, and as soon as you can't feel that little scritchy scratch, um, if you go numb to it, then you'll never know that um, you're going off, it's going wrong. Well, I had just quit cigarettes and I started vaping, so I'd really noticed, wow, it only takes a little bit of an irritant. If you get used to it, you're screwed. And I started to feel that about the BHO, and I'm like, I don't know. I mean, it's cool, but this isn't really a human condition like we can't do this for millions of people just keep throwing cans over our shoulders that's not a natural this doesn't seem like i mean i'm a i'm a quite spiritual person so i'll ask this the simple question i'm like if god gives options for humans to have relief could it really come in this way i mean things that are long electricity isn't going anywhere there's 17 there's only going to become more ways to generate it. Like it's a gift. Um, and we've used it well to do amazing things. I'm like, could, if solvents are really the future of cannabis, could it really be in the gas company? They've screwed us in so many other ways. And I, I read and I read and I read. And because for instance, around the farm, I can't use a chemical degreaser. I would have to choose something like limonene. It was on my list for all these other things. I was looking up bran oil extraction because I thought just looking at different crops you could grow that were valuable i was like yeah this brand oil seems like a good idea and i'm like what they're extracting it with limonene instead of hexane i'm like oh that's so ecologically sound and then i just kept reading and reading and reading and i'm like what if oh my god what if this could be applied to cannabis and i started googling that and then there was just this stream of people that saying this would be the ultimate but it seems to be impossible. Well, what was the argument there that uh, people were saying it was seemingly impossible? Boiling point. They live in a world of butane will boil at room temperature. So it's naturally leaving the extract as um, you after you, ex- after you pull it. Um, so they live in a world where basically they have a very limited view and understanding of physics and science. So if your buddy taught you how to do something and everyone lives off the buddy taught me system, no one's ever, no one's able to question the rules of physics. So they look at it, they go, that's an amazing solvent, but we choose solvents based on their boiling points and its boiling point is too high. We quit, we give up, no way. And 
I looked at that and I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, if it's really this valuable, why don't we just work really, really hard at discovering the secret? Um, rather than just giving up and picking up another can of butane and going, it's not my problem, close threat. So it dug at me and it dug at me and um, I had to learn everything about extraction so i had to learn everything about butane propane i didn't know why it bubbled why it sizzled i literally started i just treated it like what if you had to do your career over from scratch and you didn't have 20 years what would you need to know what would you need to skip who would you have to trust for information and i started going up the bho ladder that way until i could find an understanding that kind of gave me a thesis statement so it's funny it's everything vfx taught me about organizing complex systems getting um a picture from a videotape into one department to the next department to coloring to the final compositing to the output um i'm a pipeline architect so um i could basically if i just learn how to do every job of every department um I can figure out the whole process and then design a way to work for myself. So I learned steam distillation. I learned all the different forms of extractions. And then one day it, you have enough information that that divine inspiration clicks in your brain as a, oh my God, I'm so stupid. I can't believe it's this simple. Right. Well, you say simple, but it sounds like a lot to do, you know? <laughs> uh, so moving forward, is there an aha moment to figuring out being able to use uh, limonene, uh, or did you look for other options? I decided to learn physics. I was like, you know what? The e because the thing is, when you're looking at how do I get into a market that's, I'm like, I'm not going to be able to make my way up the butane ladder. That's impossible. It's real. I'm like, these guys are 19. I'm an adult with a family. Like, I'm an adult. I can't be at the rallies with my hat pat backwards. That's not, it's not viable. Um, I'm not like I literally I went into a bong store and asked the guy like do you know where you think you could get weed because I need something cheaper than a dispensary I did not have any connections socially in the cannabis industry so the aha came from they kept going on about boiling and vacuum and boiling and vacuum and how you can lower lower the boiling point and then I realized I'm like wait a second limonene is extracted from orange peels orange peels are a tough object oil is not as tough as an orange peel i can extract the limonene with steam from the oil just like i did from the orange peel just repeat the process and low by using vacuum the thing they're all going crazy about water will boil at the temperature of butane and therefore you can make the shatter like they make it because shatter needs um you have to keep it cool you can't if it gets hot it won't be shatter and if i don't create something that's actually what the kids want and i just create some another health product that looks all fringish then um i won't be of any use i'm um, because i could never understand i'm like there's co2 oil it's a healthy option why what, what am i needed for there's no need for me and then i'm like no one seems to want this goo they didn't make it meet all of the things butane could do there's no point in offering an alternative if you really can't make it dance the same. So I had to, that was the real challenge. It's one thing to extract with limonene and just cook it down and eat it. Um, it's another thing to make it dance the same as hydrocarbons. That's the real gift. And that's really the intellectual property is being able to make something like shatter. Oh, so that's it. Uh, the secret is water. <laughs> the secret is water. The secret is water. The secret is I'm, I never, the secret is I don't actually I, I'm not going after limonene. I go after water and limonene comes with it. Right. So you figure it all, you know, you figure all this out. How did you begin to start putting this knowledge mm. uh, you now have into something physical? Uh, or were you already doing it at the same time? No, you check this out. So being um, that kind of um, nature eccentric nut and then having all that computer graphics money and stress to spend on your three weeks vacation you get between movies um i had a steam distillation set that i like you know i spent a thousand bucks on a whole steam distillation kit and got home got all excited ripped all my oregano out of the yard made a few drops of oregano oil pat myself on the back and put it away and you know waited for the wife to look at another purchase that never went into commercial use like i thought 
there was constant buying for like, don't worry, I'm going to get good at this and then get out of my career. But, um, you know, once you've ripped out your two by two patch of oregano oil, you're out of the steam distillation business. So <laughs> I literally went in and I, I started with orange peels. I'm like, okay, if I can do this. So all my first you know, versions were all cooked, you know, to shit. There was no vacuum. There's no technology yet. There was just proving you could pull it out without having to actually pull it by just sending water through oil. Um, like I, I've watched every piece of equipment I've bought. It was a thesis. I didn't know if it was going to work or do anything that I expected. Um, I watched video after video on the reasons why rotary evaporators explode before being willing to turn mine on but um i don't and i guess that's what's made me unique is because i've learned myself i wasn't just automatically i didn't adopt anything i judged every piece of information that i was bringing in really i'm like i'm trusting this like you're my mentor my teacher my father my i'm gonna base everything off what i know off of you so it better be an mit course on rotary evaporator safety yeah if you're going to do something do it right and uh and when there's a, a lot to do, it, it can take a lot of time. And that seems to be why I'm still the only person that can do it. People don't have, they don't have the heart, passion, or the professionalism to be diligent enough to stick to anything. Their brain says, I can't learn this in two hours. I'm just going to go back to what I want to, I usually do, the status quo. Right. And what do you think about the ladder uh, that allows people to get their foot in the door more easily? Well, the problem with the ladder is it starts with only 80 bucks worth of equipment and you doing the worst harm and getting the same price until you get basically your there's with me. There was you need twenty thousand dollars to find out if you're an idiot where someone's like for 80 bucks, you can start hustling. And once you've made your first $10,000, you can buy equipment so that um, you can work faster. But at no, no point is there ever a line that says if you can't make it up to here, you can't enter. Like, oh, you want to sell brownies? Show me your commercial kitchen. Invest in some stainless steel and show me you're serious. So that's been, that was, that was Basically, I subsidized the whole thing with all my life savings. Wow. Yeah. So if it's easy for people to get in and there's more beneficial methods of extraction being produced, why are there not more people getting involved in it? It. So, for instance, I just told you all it takes is water vacuum and it should be as simple as that. Some people go, oh, of course, I know what to do. But those people are already gifted and have a background to convert that simple information Someone else has to go and learn the physics of why water boils and they become lazy and they give up. And when I participate with those people, um, what they lack is understanding of everything about butane that makes a product competitive or not. So they can understand the rules, but um, you literally you end up having to turn the chemist, the physicist, them back into hash makers or else they don't know when to shut off the machine before they lose all the terps. What would you say should be a focus in order to bring some more people into the industry and keep raising those standards? Um, in my looking at um, how I built boutiques and other careers, um, it is literally going to be training. I don't see currently any incentive to go in my route until a regulation slams a door in your face. So for instance, in California, the new laws that have come out have pretty much doubled down. Yes, we consider any home production of extracts to be um, a methamphetamine charge. So for instance, if let's say I brought LHO to the California market, everyone would be like, yeah, neat, that's nice, but um, this is how I earn my living. Um, so if you wanna join that, great, if not, who cares? Now, when a dispensary is becomes part of that chain of if you have the BHO, you become more and more liable in the crime than just the person who produces it. Then BHO starts dissipating from shelves. CO2 becomes the only option. And then you have the actual customers who are like, I don't like this CO2 oil. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to go start buying things illegally again. That's where... If I was an infrastructure to say, well, look, we can supply you, you, and you, California, it, right now, today, California would be absolutely ready for it. 
So, you know, as we've been talking, Horatio, I see this trend of thinking in you, you know, and it's not in a lot of other people. Uh, how was your creativity and, and let's say determination uh, shaped by how you do things at work? Oh, well, I mean, you could imagine in computer graphics, um, minorities are supra minor. And um, it doesn't help when um, my, my way of approaching things is very, very unorthodox and intuitive. Um, so it can be very frustrating for people who want to manage um, good cogs in a wheel. Um, so, for instance, on Harry Potter, um, I'm the type of artist to think about the movie as if it's mine and what I want to do. So I'm paying attention to what's missing to make this a complete experience. Um, so Voldemort's, I think it was Harry Potter 5, when he fir they first bring Voldemort back to life and the real bad guy comes, he comes out of some pot as um, some embryo. Well, when he, fir he first begins walking... Um, in that part of the movie, it was a series of shots that I ended up um, responsible for. It starts out there where there's a shot of him looking down at his feet and straight up. And it's, the shot's almost done. And I'm like, wait a minute. What the fuck kind of feet has Voldemort got? Are those women's stockings over human socks? And the answer was yes. There was no nobody in the entire chain of the entire movie remembered to order some visual effects for his feet. And he didn't have feet when he walked out, so we went and got some werewolf feet and threw that on. Then he grabs Harry Potter and like puts the wand to his face and sticks out his cleft tongue. They completely forgot it. It was my shot. I ran out, put my tongue in the scanner, like textured his tongue, um, built a split snaking tongue with a little bit of animation, and like for instance, that's my tongue in the movie as like... The shot is almost delivered. They're ready to pay for it. We're all supposed to be laid off. And I'm like, hey, uh, what the fuck is with his tongue? I thought this guy was a snake. So um, those little things. But within that struggle is how many shows I had to do to even get on Harry Potter. Because um, as you go from region to region, respect for your, your portfolio goes through the floor. Um, when I got to London, some guy was like, Oh, San Francisco? Oh, what did they do? I'm like, well, I worked on Harry Potter, sorry, um, Hellboy, and I worked on Sky Captain and all these movies. And he's like, well, we don't really pay to watch those movies around here. And I'm like, hey, man, that's my life. You can't just, you can't just do that. You just shit on my whole life. Do you know what I had to do to get to America? I had to work illegally. There were, I came, I got was just at a point in my career where Bush came in and was like, if you don't have a college diploma, you ain't coming to our country. And I was like, uh, I don't have a college diploma. I'm 22 with seven years experience. Uh, what the fuck? And yeah. And, um, it was a company that, um, they saw my portfolio and they're like, look, we need you. We need you really fucking bad. If you can find a way to get here by Monday, we'll, figure something out and I'm like I'm getting there by Monday and I had and of course I um I rose way too far up the ladder became management at 23 I went home for two weeks vacation we came back tried to do a visa and poof I got busted and uh, that's what sent you traveling again uh yeah that kicked me over to London pretty much I was I was always destined to be a San Francisco LA kid and a guy, basically, I was in the thing going for, like, a management consultant visa. And um, the guy comes back and he's like, do you like movies? I'm like, yeah. He's like, how long do these movies take? And I'm like, I don't know, like, six months to do? He's like, would it ever take you five months and 29 days? And at that point, my heart started beating, like, oh, my God. And I'm like, that's exactly the amount of time I stayed. He went home for two weeks, then came back, and he's like, told me this long story. And I started crying my eyes out. I'm like, you don't understand. I worked seven years for this job and I finally got management and you can't do this. And he's like, I'm going to do you a really big favor, kid. You're going to get the fuck out of here and I'm going to go get some coffee. And um, he's like, and you're not going to look back. And I went home and I called the lawyer and he's like, did they fingerprint you? I'm like, no. He's like, did they photograph you? I'm like, no. He's like, did they handcuff you? I'm like, no. He's like, the guy just said, get the fuck out of here. I'm going to get some coffee. And he's like, you're the luckiest man alive. Don't come back. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. So so what ended up happening uh, with your job at the time and, and, and the rest of that story? 
Well, the only final end to that story is I was banned from the U.S. for six years, and I had to come back to film some dogs. And I said, look, I got to go to California. I'm taking pictures of some talking puppies. And she said, I love those movies. And her hand stamped it. And I, that was the end of that story of being banned. Unbelievable. I wonder if that somehow plays into your move uh, into becoming a concentrate specialist. Well, it was, it was just that I, well, the thing is, it was that totally related to that. I, no more blood. I'm going to do something positive and... So you could say now, whatever future I have in affecting America is very linked to my decision to um, devote my efforts to talking dogs versus more blood, because that's what got me in. Right. Do you think that the way you maneuver through the cannabis world today has to do with the problems you've encountered before, uh, you know, like the ones from the story you just mentioned? Um, well, what's unique, I guess, about me is coming from that professional structure. I don't go for a lot of the, hey, man, you could just come on out here and make a ton of bunch of money with me. And I'm like, uh, do you have an itinerary for me? Are you talking about visa applications? Because usually when I get a call from a any, but like, because I'm from visual effects, like someone's like, we'd love you on the show. I'm like, well, email me the paperwork and I'll be on a flight in two days and I'll have my visa and everything. And I know what I'm doing with this industry of, um, Hey man, as long as you show up, I'm like, you're not exactly explaining how I'll get paid. Um, we don't really have proper commerce and I'm not eligible for any form of funny business. I'm too old. You could say, right? Well, Hopefully, as things continue moving forward in policies, you know, and such, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see a larger push for those types of discussions in everyday work. Yeah. And um, the market is half and half. You've got these like the people we, I met at your conference. I'm like, this is the world I hoped ruled. They're competent, professional adults with experience from other markets that are applying it to cannabis, not people who've grown up in cannabis all along never really um just kind of always lived off of i get paid this because i'm willing to face jail i'm like that's courageous today but tomorrow it's just the reason why i'm getting ripped off and um when they have such a history of that and now they're maturing they just look like they're they're learning how to mouth the words of professionalism to get them into the next zone but none of the keynote attributes that come with it um None of the tick boxes are there. I'm like, well, if we really want to start, when are you going to send me an NDA? As soon as I don't hear, you know, that means uh, like what an NDA is. I'm like, this is over. My intellectual property will be gone as soon as you trade six buddies to screw me. Where I come from with like, look, we're going to, you're going to sign this NDA. I'm going to give you a swipe card and that's going to get you into the room where we have the conversation. You will never, the KFC formula. Um, I should, so, um. I think it's very possible. Yeah. And it's every, you know what the thing is? Every company has that. Every part, it's a normal part of society that we don't think about that every Taco Bell has a delivery of a certain ingredient that the employees do not know what makes it up. They just know they're supposed to put it on when anyone orders number C. Right. Are there any other people in the industry uh, that you see and think, you know, hmm, I, I like what they're doing or, or see as uh, raising the bar uh, in, in some way. There are a lot of different fractions that I'm like, yeah, man, that's what I want to look like when I go legit. Or like, this is the audience I want to serve. Like, I remember I went on Mary's Medicinal sites because I make so the concentrates is, you could almost say one side of things, but it has spawned so many um, of the health product sides of things that... I'm just as innovative right now for transdermal balm. So when I go to like Mary's Medicinals and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at all these things that work for the app. I think about the market of the my aunt, my mother. Yeah, a balm, a roll on for her elbow, something. The ways to make it actually work for regular people, not just giving them a jar of Gupta and saying, go for it. It's got the meds in it. Um, I really like how um, Mary's Medicinals has presented themselves to the point where I wouldn't even know it was cannabis related. Um, and um, their CBD products, because the CBD side of things is able to be on Amazon and those things, I'm like, I like that. Um, that looks like the kind of thing where one day they'll get a contract to be on every Walgreens shelf. 
Um, and that's how you actually, that's how you actually engage suffering. It's somebody walking with a bad knee that goes, oh, what? Um, transdermal bomb. So um, I like that side of thing. I also like um, what I've seen Tony Verzura do. Um, he's new in Harborside. Um, they brought in his solventless hash oil. Um, they're a place that's been um, big on searching for answers to... Um, basically, they're too big to um, play that funny game um, when it comes to being a dispensary. They can't afford to have wax on the shelf when you know BHO is banned. Um, so they brought in the solventless. Um, his approach, um, he's, he's got the capsules, he's got the tinctures, he's got the recreational style um, bubble hash and those type of things um but again he's in a situation where legislation is constantly and regulation is constantly pushing him to the most reasonable situation possible so where when i first met him i'm like yeah we're going to do amazing things in denver that became we're going to do amazing things on native land in california then it turns into we're going to do amazing things in more mid california in harborside and they're all opportunities but they're all quite different um, one can be very remote and um, just produce and just shipping um, stuff to many places. And one can be very, um, in his case, they built him a store inside of the store. So I'm like, I'm like, wow, that's really setting your whole product line of what you do apart so that you can down to um, how the last thing that's said to every patient, you get you get to actually direct that. So I'm a bit of a control freak about the full experience, because without the full experience, it can go right over a patient's head. If someone doesn't get that nurse Heather experience with the product, then it can sit on their shelves and gold can go to waste. Right, okay. Well, let's talk about some of the uses of concentrates and how it's different, you know, from other things. Now, that's where it gets really interesting because as you go across the solvents and you give them all the same cannabis, you do not get the same message. And th if you put if you do an alcohol extraction, it won't extract the terpenes that make people go crazy over BHO. So if, if we only did alcohol extraction, we would never experience the, modif the modulate, modulations in our high from terpenes that are only extracted by nonpolar solvents. So it's literally like there are, sol there are, terp there are solvents that are po positive and solvents that are negative. Alcohol is a positive solvent. So it's fr that's why it, people don't like it because it's friends with chlorophyll. It extracts chlorophyll. That's what makes... If, you, if we wanted chlorophyll and chlorophyll was medicine, alcohol would be our friend. Where butane doesn't extract chlorophyll. So because it makes gold extracts, it's our friend. But depending on what's medicine now, we've kind of given up all the trust in extracting the medicine to some random solvent that was just good for a lazy man's purpose. That's a very scary concept. I'm like, no, if that's the case, then we should just go back to burning it. At least we get the whole thing at once. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and again, Horatio, all this information you're mentioning just shows that that working mindset you have, uh, you know, that we were talking about earlier. Well, I, because again, I didn't start as a chemist. I became one over needing a deeper understanding. I went into, um, so like, let's say a chemist is listening to this. I came across something called the carry butyl index. And I'm like, what's that? And I'm like, well, it's an index for how strong a solvent is. And I'm like, what do you mean by how strong? And I'm like, well, how much grabbing power? I'm like, you mean like shoplifting? Like some solvents have two hands, some solvents have four hands, and some solvents have four hands with 10 fingers and they're sticky. I'm like, okay, so if everyone throws their solvent past the cannabis plant, what are you grabbing? Well, I looked at bubble hash. It says we're going to grab everything in different micron sizes. And I'm like, well, which ones are good for smoking? Well, we only smoke the 70. You, that's the gold. I'm like, well, wait a minute. The cannabis plant is all of these different heads. And you're saying three out of the four types are unsmokable because it doesn't work with your method. Hey, wait a second. That's kind of not cool, is it? You're not really give. I needed to, I don't, none of us know what's the secret that works for us in cannabis. So it's really deadly to say, I have a pure method that um, only, that extracts this fraction. And then you find out that fraction is not where your favorite terpene comes from. And you've only been smoking the light note. That, um, that starts to freak me out. I'm like, no one has the right to give a prescription. So going up the ladder, so I went up through butane and I'm like, okay, butane is a 20 on this index of what it's able to take. 
and then I found propane. I'm like, okay, propane's 22. It's a little bit stronger. I see why some people extract with propane and get these weird colors and make themselves a market by that subtle difference. Then I found limonene, and I'm like, 67? It is three times stronger than butane. Is that why people get a different high? that seems to give unique medical benefits that are not they're not experiencing when they just buy run-of-the-day BHO. I'm like, holy shit, if I was a pharmaceutical company, that would be like a humongous advantage if there were two products and one worked and one didn't work and it was by the fact that um, a natural terpene is naturally synthesizing with cannabis. We ha I have no idea if I'm grabbing a half a percent of a cannabinoid we've never heard of. And that's why it relieves migraines like compared to everything else so I trusted nature times nature should give us the strongest result and um, I'm seeing that every day in all these subtle ways that come back as patient feedback and um, I think if even if in one one day we're all used, we're we're in it for the medical warfare of no I really really can prove my shit gets rid of hemorrhoids um, or whatever and the real, you know, the real medicine we hoped for, the shit that worked, not just saying like, look, I'm going to suppress what's bothering you and you're also going to piss your pants twice a day, which is common medicine. So um, that is really the frontier in which I'm like, no one's even here hearing out my anecdotal information, never mind us putting it into real clinical trials or getting some scientific data of proof that says, no, your extract 100% has this, this, and this, and CO2 is not grabbing it, and butane is not grabbing it, and alcohol is not grabbing it. So It seems as if you have a direct objective and standard mm -hmm. for where you want the industry to be. Uh, you're not settling for what's being done today. Uh, instead, you want that informative discussion and structure mm -hmm. and, and scientific validation. That's the trust that I'm like, if I'm ever going to find the key to being able to consistently, therapeutically open the light within people, it's going to be nature times nature. Not nature times my best thinking of the time, which is butane. And in 100 years, it'll be something else. And in you know what I mean? Certain things, limonene has been steam distilled since forever. And it'll be here forever. And cannabis has been here forever. And it'll, both, will, both will get wiped off the planet at the same time. Right. Well, that leads me to the last two questions. Uh, the first one, what has most surprised you in cannabis? And I want you to answer that question first. The second one is what has most surprised you in life? What has most surprised me in cannabis is the light the human the fact that it seems to be the greatest tool to tackle human suffering that has been given from nature like flat out like i don't i every that it's that's what i mean i took like even in my extraction i'm like okay well what happens if i put in a transdermal i put it out there i'm like i just threw in a free sample with each whatever i was doing one report comes back, hey, so my cousin who got his finger cut off in a stabbing, he put it on his hand and it's healing him and it's not burning. Hey, so I tried your things on my temple. I have chronic migraines. It's healing. Hey, I have CRPS, chronic um, regional pain syndrome. Here's a picture of my arm normally. Here's a picture of my arm tonight. And I'm like, uh, and then I get another message. So my father had 142 stitches after lymphoma surgery. So from his belly button, split in a V through his crotch, right back to his anus. I'm like, oh dear God, this is too much product trial. This is where any other pharmaceutical product ends up with terrible side effects and terrible karma. And I get, I'm like, so how did it go? And I get a response back. He's in heaven and he's also using it on his back and on and on and on. And I'm like, that is just me tackling, trying to create a product for everyone who will not eat cannabis. I was trying to just, I'm like, I'll just hedge my bets. And I'm like, how strong, how much medicine could I force through the skin in a unique far way using the best thinking? And I went into transdermals, which are not, they're topically applied, but they're, they go through the skin and I'm, I'm baffled. I'm absolutely baffled at the things that I'm like, no, real suffering is that knee that stops you from playing with your grandson every time. If I can give that guy back his knee, everything else wrong with him was A-OK -okay and he can die happy. The fact that cannabis can do those types of things 
And um, it's just a matter of us setting up cannabis to do it right. Uh, that's really been the most astonishing that there's a good chance I may be able to complete a large portion of my life's purpose in healing mankind using this plant. What's most surprised me in life? Um, finding a spiritual pathway. Well, no, I, how would I put this? What most surprised me in life was that through um, spiritual devotion, um, my, by devoting my intellect to my heart, to my heart's purpose, I've been able to expand my intellect be completely beyond any capacity that I ever imagined for myself as a person. There is no way a simple guy who managed to make it to a decent, you know, rough but successful living in computer graphics could turn around, switch careers, and then be at the front of the potential for medicine and cannabis. Is, that is all the spiritual rules that say, don't pick up this can, go the long route, go to Mount Zion, go crawl on your knees, the harder it is, the more true your pathway is. The fact that that is true and I've seen its truth applied to cannabis, that that's what shakes me up is I'm like, the power is still given to the most genuine people, not the smartest. Great, Horatio. Thanks uh, for taking the time to talk. Very much appreciate it. Take care. Horatio Delbert. And so if you were wondering, you know, about the tongue in that Harry Potter movie, now you know. Uh, what a good guy, you know, obviously completely and totally passionate uh, about what he's doing and, and what about what should be done. Uh, so we appreciated uh, Horatio's time. Again, a completely unique guy.